Hey everyone, and welcome to the Doctors Running Podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of the things that we put on our feet. Today, we have an amazing guest who we're very honored to have on the podcast, Kara Goucher. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So we have some questions for you. And again, as always, the point of this podcast is to be as educational as possible. We're going to go in a couple different directions. We are going to see where this goes. But honestly, and I was telling you this part, I'm just geeking out having you here because I grew up in Portland, got to see you, got to see your husband, got to see like, oh, like all the stuff, reading your book and going, oh my gosh, I've known about the stories. But to get that in depth and actually not be that far away is a very interesting experience, but your strength throughout this is probably the most important thing. I think that's one of the most inspirational parts is the strength to go through this to continue. And now like you're a parent, you're a pet parent. This is phenomenal. <laughs> I'm, I'm even more impressed. Like, cause I might have a seventh month old right now. And my wife, my wife, who is the superhuman trying to support her, like just trying to go through stuff. And then you watching you go through this is really cool. So, well, I might, I might go off topic and pick your brain on like post run, like post part of like running and things like that, but I don't want to take the podcast because Andrea has some great questions like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Kara. Um, like Matt mentioned, um, we are talking about Kara's book, The Longest Race. Um, it's been out for a while, but it's coming out in paperback in April. Is that right? Um, it's coming out March 26th, I believe. Oh, excellent. In paperback. Yeah. Pretty soon. Um, so Matt and I both really enjoyed reading your book. Um, I am not from Portland, but as a former professional cyclist, I really related to a lot of the stuff you wrote about your struggles um, at Nike and just with the support you were receiving. So it's kind of cathartic for me to read it because you can talk to other athletes about it, but then to like see it in print. Um, it was just, I really enjoyed reading your book. You're very well written. Um, so thank you for coming on and sharing your story with us. Um, before we get into the main set, we always do a subjective for our listeners. And I think it'll be a good one for all of us to answer to. So this week's subjective is, if you could change one thing about the sport of running, what would it be? And let's start with Kira. Um, okay. If I could change one thing about the sport of running, what would it be? I think right now I would change how obsessed we are with times and I would make us remove clocks and just get back to racing and loving racing. And I think we are, we're kind of in this shift right now where records are falling and it's exciting, but I think it has this trickle down effect through all levels of running. And I wish we could just get back to like enjoying running and not always being so focused on the clock and seeing the clock as your measurement of success instead of like getting out there and racing and accomplishing something. So I'm, I'm kind of like on a, yeah, that's my thing right now. I wish we could get away from the clock and just focus on running and racing. I love that. It's so much more fun to just go out and race rather than like, Oh, I've got this goal time and I want to hit my splits. Like just getting out there, seeing if you can pass people yeah. feeling like you gave your all that's, that's so rewarding to get to the finish line and just feel like you did the best you could on the day and maybe you passed a few people at the end. But then like if your time isn't a PR, that can almost ruin the experience for you. And that's not what it's all about. Yeah, I totally, I get, I get there's a time for chasing times and there's obviously it's important at the elite level at, at certain circumstances, but I do feel like, yeah, we, we've, we've forgotten that we no matter what, we probably did our best. And just because we didn't get a PR doesn't mean we failed in any way. So I just see it at all levels right now, at the elite level, at the high school level, at the youth level. Everyone seems to be so obsessed with time. And I just wish we could just like pump the brakes and move away from it for a little bit. Get back to That's the actual great. pure, like what, what racing really is. Yeah. Like, there's so one thing to race yeah. against the clock, but I totally agree that I think people have lost. There's an art to racing and sometimes that's racing other people. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's just racing against yourself and like letting go of the clock and going, can I give the best effort out there? Cause especially like when you start talking about longer distances, like, you know, marathon, like for when we're recording the LA marathon is going on right now. And anybody that goes to that course going, yeah, I want to hit X time. I'm like, do you know what that course is like? Yeah. It's like, it's like a definition <laughs> it's kind of, of a living. Hard one. <laughs> it's a hard course. Like, even though they say it's a net downhill, I'm like, is it though? It's right, like up right. and down. It's like, don't worry, like get the best out of the day, compete, like enjoy that. Because sometimes there's elements, typically a lot LA gets hot. A lot of the Olympic trials courses get hot. A lot of the Olympics uh, marathons get really hot. It's like, well, you know, time may not be as important as just going out there and like 
giving your best, but whether it's an elite athlete and then especially recreational athletes, I think you made a great point that a lot of recreational athletes, and there's nothing wrong with pushing yourself, but when you start wrapping up your entire identity in what exactly your time is, you're going to lose like the fun aspect of the sport and not to get really nerdy and technical, the more you kind of put some of that psychological stuff in there, we know from evidence on that. And this is one of my areas where I really enjoy, and I will not say I'm an expert, I'm learning, but like when it comes to like chronic pain and patho and stuff like that, you can start getting psychosomatic symptoms, even if you don't have a tissue injury and you, that pain is very real. And so I've seen lots of people recently, especially before LA going, I got to hit this time and I'm freaking out. I'm like, you're, I, I can't, trace your back pain to any source except your fear. fear pain is mm -hmm. a threat response. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're totally, I'm like living this right now and watching. And I've definitely experienced that too in college with the like pressure of, you know, I did not compete on the same level that you or your husband did or that Andrew's a pro athlete, but I still got to compete in the NCAA system and you're freaking out. How am I going to make it? And stuff pops up. It's life's too short. Like you gotta have yeah. some fun with this. And you lose like, you know, obviously I'm a little bit older. And so we didn't have GPS until I was mm -hmm. a professional. Right. So like, yeah. I just grew up, like, I don't even know how long my runs were when I was in high school. I thought right. they were five miles. They're probably right. like three and a half or whatever, but I feel like we've lost like just your intrinsic data of, mm -hmm. of like that feeling of like, okay, I'm a little over the edge. I need to back up right. because we just do this. And we're like, well, my watch says I'm okay. Yeah. Even though, you right. know, I'm, my watch says I'm on the right pace, even though I can barely breathe right now. Right. Or my watch says I'm doing fine, even though maybe you could be pushing more. So I just, right. yeah, I just feel like we've gotten away from, there's a place for the watch 100%. It's yep. a good guidance, but we've gotten away from people just being in touch with their bodies, which is like the most fun part about running is like right. when you have those breakthrough days because you trusted yourself. A Andrew, remind me, there is, I think this was done in cyclists that some of the best measurements of knowing how you're recovering and your effort levels actually come from internal measurements of like your self perceived amount rather than like watch GPS and stuff like that. Is that correct? Am I citing that correctly? Um, I don't know if that was a cycling study, but I would certainly agree with that. That like your internal indicators of how you're feeling are more accurate than like anything your watch is going to tell you for sure. And slightly Kara. off topic, Kara, I don't know. Oh, I don't think. Sorry, Andrew. Oh, go for it. I was just going to say I'm clo I'm almost Kara's age and I, you know, didn't have a GPS watch till college. And same thing, like I remember in high school and middle school, you just went out and ran. And I remember one of my uh, teammate sisters who was an NCAA runner, she could perfectly pace any run we did and then if like you went back and measured it with the car she was spot on like we had run this pace and this many miles and it was so impressive and like how many people can do that now right we're so reliant on our right. gps watches to tell us so yeah, yeah i think there's a big place for just putting a piece of tape over your watch or hiding it in your pocket and just going out and running you know, I had, I, when I first started running for my high school, I just had a swatch watch yep. and like my coach yeah. would be like, go run for 30 minutes. And I'd look and I'd be like, okay, it's three 30 yep. and I'll turn around at three 45. <laughs> and then I call this is actually in the book, but I qualified for foot locker, which yep. was like the na yep. national high school championship at the time. And we went for a run and everyone like started their Timex. So I ended up getting a Timex for Christmas that year, but I'm glad, I'm actually glad that that's how I grew up because it really was about like, how are you feeling yeah. or, or just like the time, but no, I'm, you know, I wasn't getting feedback on how fast I was running. It was just like, Oh, my coach wants me back in 30 minutes. So, Oh, right. I hit 15 minutes. I'm going to turn around. So I don't know. There's something pure about that. And it's funny because I have a 13 year old and he has a Garmin. He got one for Christmas and he's super obsessed with it. And sometimes I'm like, I should take that away from him. I should just take that away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening yeah. very closely on parenting tips. Like, okay, when do I take the tech away? Even though they can yeah. get mad at me. Yeah, he forgets so, a lot because he's 13. So that, yeah. that at least oh, is yeah. good. Like he only yeah. runs twice a week. And so it, he really only gets half of his runs on there. But he'll be like plugging it in and looking at it. And I'm like... At 13, I didn't even have a Timex yet, you know? Anyway. I'm laughing especially hard because I was like, I wonder what watch she had. I was like, I bet it was a Timex. I was like, yeah, because I <laughs> oh, had yeah. one of the original, <laughs> the, the same Timex watches for years. Oh, yeah. And then it would like break apart, stop like after yeah. like several years. <laughs> and you go to Fred Meyers and go find the new one that's $20. And you're like, how is this only $20? This thing is amazing. And then I know. You know, now they're 300 So Yeah, I know. They, you can't get those cheap ones anymore. But no. Oh, well, <laughs> slightly off topic. I don't know. So talking about like learning it, like 
internal sensation of like pace and things like that. I don't know if you know this, and we talk about this all the time because we're all shoe geeks. A lot of the current evidence for finding the optimal shoe for you actually has moved very much away from the biomechanical model. So all the stuff like, oh, you got to get on the treadmill and ha- you have to have this level alignment. That is not working. It's not consistent. What we've actually found is that how you feel in the shoe, how comfortable it is, and there's a couple of cool researchers that actually pared it down to five different sensations. Those things, how you perceive it is actually way more predictive of whether a shoe is going to work for you or not. Way more so than, hey, get on the treadmill. How do you look? So it's like, wow. oh, this is interesting. What are those that five kind things? Of, so the five things are, how is the cushioning in the heel? How is the cushioning in the forefoot? How is the overall flexibility? How's the stability? And then how's the fit? And there's no, it's not like, oh, more is better. It's, how, is it totally just right for you? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes, it's I mean, the, that makes sense, yeah. right? It's called yeah. the run cat scale. So it's actually more effective oh, if you hold cats while you're doing it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I love that. I would love to hold my cats and run. I'm sure yeah. they'd be thrilled. <laughs> yeah. I'm really glad I got that joke out. I was able to hold <laughs> it straight good. face through that. It was yeah, good. Thank you. Good job, Matt. <laughs> Thanks. So Matt, what would, if you could change one thing about the sport of running, what would it be? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, Kara, you you nailed that one in terms of like getting people back to focusing on the joy of running and not getting so data obsessed. Although data can be helpful if you use it the right way. Probably mine comes actually not from me. So my wife is the pro runner. She's she was sponsored by Salomon, and so that's changed. Things have changed a little bit since having a, a kid, and she's kind of trying to come back in shape. But I I will say, and hopefully this doesn't come off negatively. I did not understand even knowing and like knowing some of the like hearing things, not being a pro athlete myself, I didn't know what that looked like for us runners until I was with my wife and then got to see what sponsorship really looks like and then get to meet people from Europe and look at what their sponsorship looks like. And so if I would change anything and if somebody asked me how I had no idea, it would be to actually provide some kind of true system to truly support athletes and runners, because what they're doing right now is just, it's not sustainable. And it's so hard. It's so much extra stress. Like, thank goodness she and I both had full-time jobs and I could support her. And I, she had, she had a pacer. It's really hard. So if you don't have those things, I can't even imagine. So I would change how we support the athletes, what that looks like and how that goes about. I have no idea, but that's the biggest thing watching her go through this stuff. So let's, I think the one thing I would change, and I I think I say this because it's definitely applicable to me right now is I think in, especially in the recreational runner realm or like the non-pro realm, people focus so much on the marathon, like, oh, like that's the pinnacle of running, Mm -hmm. you know, but for those of us who aren't like really geared towards that distance, running a fast 5k is just as awesome as running a fast marathon and it takes a different skill set and different physiology. So I wish that just the running world in general would celebrate or focus on every race distance as something special as opposed to like, oh, if you're a runner, like you have to run the marathon. Otherwise, you know, what are you doing? Yeah, I love both of those contract reform and and the marathon isn't the know-all, end-all, be-all. Like, I'll never run another marathon. Realistically, I won't. And that, so what, I just don't have purpose and I can't, like, have joy in my running anymore, right. you know? And, I mean, this is coming from someone who absolutely loved the marathon. But it's, it's not for everybody. And it's like, I feel like when people find out you're, that you're a runner, if they're, not, if they're not runners, they're like, well, how fast can you run a mile and have you run a marathon? You know, and you're like, right. I'm going to disappoint you here because my mile's not that fast. <laughs> and yes, I've run a marathon, but you know, it's just, it's, it, it's like, that's just like what people assume is the next logical step. So I agree. Like training for a 5k can be fun and rewarding and everybody's different. Everyone has different skill sets and that shouldn't be like, oh, just a 5k. Right. It's like, that's right. awesome. You're running a 5k. That is yeah. so cool. Yeah. Yep. It's like in cycling, like oh, you're a pro cyclist. Have you ever done the Tour de France? Well, right. I knew there's no women's go. Tour de France. <laughs> right. There used well, to be. <laughs> I'm a woman. And then also, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a couple <laughs> things stacked against me here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all or nothing. And I don't, I don't, and, and why, I mean, again, I love the marathon, but why is that the distance that we've decided is like the one distance that proves you're a real runner? Right. You know, like that's ridiculous. Yeah. And that just excludes so much of the community that we have. So 
if you want to run a marathon, awesome. If you don't, that's fine too. You can run whatever you want. That's the whole point. Some of us want to see how fast we can do a 5K while pushing a stroller, which is where my life is right now. Yeah, see? <laughs> so I still find that I buy stroller PRs now. <laughs> yeah, see, my son, my son, I know he could run faster. He ran 1857 in the 5K nice. in October, and I made him run the first few minutes with me because we had accidentally gotten into the elite wave. And so <laughs> I made him run with me for like three, four minutes, and then finally I said, you can go. So I know he could run faster, but I was like... I. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of regretting it, but I was like, I'm going to run the 5k at the Boston Marathon and see if I can beat his time. Well, it's funny that you started off talking about like pain and like, because everything hurts trying to run because you're in 606 pace. And so I haven't Mm. run anything like that in years and trying to get down to those times. I'm like, I think I hurt my patella. I think I hurt. (laughs) (laughs) And then you're like, what do you like? What's your fear? I'm like, oh yeah, it's that I'm not as fast as my son. Like it's a hundred percent what I'm terrified of (laughs) in my body (laughs) showing it. But anyway, it's been really fun to just like, I can't, I can really max out at 40 miles a week where I feel comfortable, but it's been fun to do like a little long run, a day with strides and a day with some repeats. And I'm like this, I could get into this, you know, I could get into doing this a couple times a year and it's super rewarding to see my progress, even though it's not flashy and it's not a marathon, I've made my own little progress. And so, yeah. So I guess, so the question is follow up. So how do we normalize like the that in terms of going, yes, 40 miles a week, that is your excellence level. And everybody loves to just keep adding comparisons on and Mm -hmm. on. Why can't like people learn to focus on themselves and being the best version of where they are, wherever that is. Like, I mean, I I do feel things like Strava and stuff are good and bad, right? Because they just blow it up. Like, you know, like I just started sharing on Strava again for the first time in almost 10 years. Wow! And um, the first post I had was uh, my first double digit run I've done in almost a year. And I was, I was embarrassed to share it. And I put in the caption, like, I'm embarrassed to post this, but I'm actually really Mm. proud of it because I haven't run in the double digits in almost a year. Um, But, and it's been good. It's been a good experience. I, I, you know, I'm on the treadmill a lot with my dystonia and I, and so I have been posting my outdoor runs and it's been, it's been good, but it's, I think that stuff is tough. And like, I, I, part of the reason why I do want to share too, is like, I'm a person Mm -hmm. that used to run 135 miles a week and I used to be like really good. And now, you know, I'm like normal. And I'm, but I've, but it's still, I would run every day because I have a goal, which is try to run 1857, which is probably not going (laughs) to happen, but I'm still going to try. And, and I've enjoyed training for it, you know? And so I, I, yeah, I, I think it's important to, to quote unquote, like just normalize that stuff. Like, and also like I'm just going off on a tangent. That's okay. We get we, we get warned older. you about this, by yes. the way. <laughs> <laughs> like I also want to normalize that we get older. Yep. And our bodies change. And sometimes mm-hmm. we have injuries or other things. And sometimes, you know, it we have to step away from what we thought made us worthy. Like I used to pride myself on that I was a high mileage person. Like I all my coaches were like, You're a workhorse, not a thoroughbred. It did not hurt my feelings. I love that. I embrace that. Um And now I I really max out at 40 miles a week. Well, that's not workhorse in it, but it is for me now, right? Like that's my new level. So what would you say then to realize that there might be somebody who 40 miles a week is a lot. That might be a huge amount. So that again, that it's like, it's all relative, right? Yeah. It's all relative. Like, I mean, I used to be a full-time athlete. That's all I did. I had the luxury of running and napping and running in and getting massage and like, you know, having my Norma tech boots and constantly having people fawn over me and help me recover. That's how I was able to run 135 miles a week. That's not what I have anymore. And now, you know, I I still, I just still pamper myself and see therapists and stuff, but I max out at 40 and that's a huge difference, but that's, that's what I can do. And I'm proud that I can do that. And, but that's all relative for someone else. It might be 10 miles a week. It might be, I mean, I don't know. My son runs like seven or eight miles a week and he's a runner, you know? So that's a whole other yeah. conversation on def- what's, what is a runner? It's like you right. run, you don't need to yes. define it any more than that. A hundred percent. Yeah. I would definitely say that, like you said, Strava and social media really encourages people to like do the max. Like, how am I going to impress my friends? Like, Oh, I did like this huge run today. But in the end, like, unless we're professional athletes, we're running for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And yeah. That's definitely something that has been different for me, like coming from professional cycling and then taking up running, which was my first sport, but I was definitely not anywhere near professional in running. Like I run because I like it and because I have goals for myself, 
but it's not the same as cycling where like you show up to a race and like, you you know, your race is the main event. Like mm-hmm. my running races aren't like that, you know, like maybe I'll win like a local 5k or something, but you know, I'm not racing internationally for running and no one cares about like my place in running besides like my friends and family, you know? So I think we just need to normalize like internal goals versus external goals. That's for most of us. That's what running is about is like, you're doing it for yourself. If you're doing it for kudos on Strava or like likes on Instagram, that's cool too. But you know, you're going to find yourself feeling unfulfilled at some point. Yeah. So it's good to find those, that internal motivation, those internal go- goals that will keep you going. Yeah. So, so I do want to pivot because you mentioned something that, that I, that I think Andrew and I talked about before that we're super curious about, given this is okay. kind of like a little more healthcare based. Um, I don't think you mentioned, I should know this since I just read the whole book yesterday. I don't think you mentioned this in your book, but can you talk a little bit about the, your runner's dystonia? Yeah. So I, you know, it's still like an ongoing process, but Mm -hmm. I was, um, when was I diagnosed? I was diagnosed in, in 2022, early 2022, I think February, but my symptoms started a long time before that. And they started basically at the end of 2020. Um, I just felt, felt like I was sleeping all the time. I would like sit down on the sidewalk and see if I had like a leaf on my shoe, especially when I would make a right hand turn. Um, and I, at, at first I was like, I know this is just totally stress related because my grandpa just died. It's, we're coming into the holidays. I'm always tired this time of year. I was catching my toe a lot. Um, then I took like a really bad fall, like really bad, um, like fell on my treadmill. I actually passed out, woke up. And after that, I just never could run and feel comfortable again. And, and I, you know, like I, I'm like, I'm an Olympian. There's nothing wrong with me and trying to run through it. And then finally one day I was out running and I fell into traffic and I called my husband. He came and got me and he's like, you have to go to the doctor. So that started a, like a full year of going to doctors and which led me, led me down this other path where, um, you know, I spent hours and hours in the MRI machine. Turns out my spine is great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, which then had me scan my brain where I found out that I had some, some, quite a few lesions, which like now I have to be, I'm worried about and I never even needed to know I had it because probably a bunch of people have them, but I just know that I have them, which led me down to it's probably MS, which it wasn't. Anyway, all this time, but finally I saw a movement specialist who was pretty sure that's what it was. And then I got in at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota um, and they, confirm the diagnosis. So it's been really tough because it's mm-hmm. not something I can push through. And actually when I try to push through it, my symptoms get worse. Yep. So it's been really hard. I mean, I th- I'm like two years in now and I'm definitely in a better space, but the first year was really difficult because I would catch a good day and push and then be like, well, I'm, I'm over it or I'm doing better. And then I'd push again. And then I would get down this hole where it would get worse and my symptoms would get worse and it would last and it's just been really frustrating. It's super hard to describe, but you guys would know what dystonia is. But basically, like how it was explained to me the very first day was somehow my brain wires got crossed. And when my left leg goes to move forward, all of the muscles fire at once instead of just the muscles that are needed. And so I have no awareness that like my foot has landed on the ground. To me, it feels like like when I was going to the doctors, I'd be like, I'm so, I'm from Minnesota and I'd be like it's like I'm I'm blindfolded and I'm stepping on freshly zambonied ice and I can't <laughs> tell if my, and they're like okay <laughs> but that's how it felt like like I yeah. can't tell if my foot is making contact or not because the, the it's so icy and it's so clean and it's so yep. smooth that I can't tell um so anyway it's been a really annoying and frustrating process yeah. but um I don't know. Basically, there you go. That's right. Well, I appreciate you sharing that stuff. So what what we wanted to kind of ask is, Andrew, have you ever seen anybody with runner's dystonia before? Not with runner's dystonia, but I've had a number of patients with, you know, regular dystonia. Um, And what works for them varies. Some people respond well to injections. Some people respond well to myofascial work. Everybody, you know, benefits from finding like the right level of exercise, but finding that as I'm sure you've figured out, Kara, is Mm -hmm. challenging and it changes day to day. 
So what treatments have you tried, if you're willing to share, and what has worked and what hasn't worked? Um, so the doctor at Mayo Clinic put me on a medicine that did not work. It made me nauseous, and I felt like I was taking steps back. So I have been on um, benztropine, like uh, cogentin, mm-hmm. but I was on it multiple times a day, and I felt so good and so normal, but I started to have a hard time... Um, I guess one of the side effects is like a little bit of brain fog. And I was having a hard time saying what I was trying to think of. And my my husband and son kept filling in the gaps. And obviously, my job is a commentator. So I had to kind of come off of it because right. I like my job. And I can't <laughs> watch really someone win it, and then be yeah. like, oh, everybody hold. Give me 10 seconds to collect my thoughts. <laughs> you know. Um, so now I just take it before I run on what would be considered a scary surface for me, which would be like a road anything smooth, I have a hard time on. So I'll just take it about 30 Mm -hmm. minutes if I'm going to run. Like if I'm going to run from my house to a trail, I'll take it because I have to run on pavement to get there. So I take it a few days a week now, 30 minutes before I run. And then, um, and then I've done, um, Botox injections because Mm -hmm. it basically kills this, the signal, like the brain fires the signal for everything to fire, but it can't because your leg is, is dead. Um, and I wasn't convinced that it was helping me. So this past year I let it wear completely off and I, I had, I I was like back to ground zero. So that was actually a good experiment. It was very frustrating because then I had, you know, I had to redo the Botox and then I had to wait for it to kick in and then, you know, it builds over treatment time. So in the end I was like really annoyed with myself, but I'm glad I did it because I just wasn't sure. Is this helping me? Is it not helping me? I don't really know. So for me, I definitely think it is helping me, but I've gone to see a neurological PT. I go in for PT uh, regularly with a regular PT. I'm always kind of like trying new things. Um, And I've, I have found that um, a lot of it, I feel like a lot of it is connected to my left glute not firing. I don't know if you guys want to go down this path. We can. I'm super curious. (laughs) And I feel like when my, when it's not firing properly, I feel like my dystonia gets worse. And so I've been doing a lot of like needlework and trying to wake that up. And then I've also found that like, if I, if I work a broadcast, I cannot run the next day because even though Uh, I'm just sitting there, I'm thinking and I'm paying really close attention and it, it really, I've learned that it drains my nervous system. And even though physically yep. I feel fine, when I try to run the day after calling a race, I'm really sloppy and I tend to trip and I get frustrated. And then I start to dig that hole. So yeah, those are the this things I've so, been doing basically. This is so cool that you picked, not only have you, do you really like, this is probably the benefit of being a, such a great athlete is you're, you have such good body awareness to be able to not only describe this, because the one person that I got, I had the honor to work with who had runner's dystonia at Costa Kalina locally here when I was doing my residency for ortho was like, had such a hard time describing what it felt like. And so even though I've never seen, I am from the Northwest, so I know what a Zamboni is. I've never (laughs) seen one. (laughs) Like tell how like, like how temperate our weather is. We don't have Zambonis in the Northwest. Oh, no, I I know, I I know. Like your description, your description makes total sense. Like that brand new ice that like in in an ice rink has just been, I'm like, that is such a great way of describing that. And the individual who I, who was, was just struggling, trying to describe what she was experiencing. But again, the symptoms really came on with those more maximal running efforts and things like that. And it was, it's interesting that you can verbalize this so well, because so many people seem to struggle that, yeah, it's a challenge with your nervous system. And it's, a, it's a very big, like a really good insight into the fact that, you know, with or without dystonia, we, whether you're recreational or elite, we do not give enough credit to the nervous system. Like you mm-hmm. do a really hard day or like have an exam or a really busy day. The next day, you're not going to be firing at hundred percent. So you can't get mad at yourself that your GPS watch says you're not running at the best effort. Like you're fatigued. Like, right. and you, people don't pay attention to that. They're just like, oh, it's just all muscle. I'm like, no, everything's controlled by this thing called your nervous system, which can get fatigued. And so it's I, of all, I feel like you have such a great platform to speak about this. You go, Hey, everybody needs to wake up and realize you actually need to be taking good care of your nervous system. We overwork it all the time. It's like we spend all, all the time. day on these things. And yeah. 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 And it, it, you know, at the end of the day, it really is like, I've had to relearn as we started at the beginning of this podcast of like being in touch with my body 
and being like, okay, yesterday was a great day. So now I know I'm a little fatigued. Now I know I'm tired. I get in the lever a lot, like, cause it just takes body weight off. And then I'm also, mm-hmm. it makes me feel secure because I'm like, you know, I'm kind of like locked in. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, and it, it helps me a lot. And I mean, I'm addicted to sunshine. So it's, it's been an adjustment to spend a lot of time indoors, um, and only run outside a few days a week. But I, but also I've been so encouraged by my neurologist. She's like, don't stop. Don't give up on yourself. Find out what your limits are. Like people get afraid and I get it. Cause I was afraid at first too. The very first doctor who diagnosed me was like, you know, you need to be careful because we don't know a lot about dystonia and this could just be the beginning flames of a bigger fire and it could spread through your body and you don't want to be able to not walk. Cause there were periods of time where I struggled to walk and I was like, well, okay, this is the worst news ever. Like I was crying right. so hard and he was like, well, you're not going to die from it. And I'm like, you're basically telling me I'm dead because yeah. you're telling me I can't <laughs> run anymore. You know? Um, and she, but she was like, no, like they, they don't know you. Like, let's find out what your limits are. I'm, you're going to be able to have something and let's find out what that is. And so we're a little over two years in and I feel like we're still learning, but um, I'm glad. I'm really grateful for her to encourage me mm-hmm. like, no, let's, you can run. We just don't know yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. Having a good care team and people that believe in you and let you lead is so important. Un- unsurprisingly, she's a runner herself. So, oh, t- yeah. <laughs> I wonder why she's able to think about this. Mm. Yeah, Kara, because there's so few movement specialists in the country, could you share who your doctor is? Because there's probably people listening who have dystonia and maybe don't have a movement specialist near them, and it might be helpful for them to know who has helped you so much. Yeah. So I see Dr. Jill Olson. She is not a neurological movement specialist. This is like the most female thing she's ever said to me. And she's like, well, I'm just a neurologist. I want you to see this, you know, (laughs) this other doctor. I'm like, just a neurologist. Okay. So anyway, (laughs) she's amazing and awesome. And she has worked with me from the beginning, but she sent me to see Dr. Trevor Hawkins, who's also in Colorado, who is an incredibly gifted movement specialist. That's what he does. And so, um, yeah. Dr. Trevor Hawkins, he's the one that gave me the first diagnosis and was, I was kind of like, I don't believe him, you know, and then I got into the Mayo Clinic where they confirmed it, but he was able to diagnose me like in moments because he's just really good at him. He's really good Mm -hmm. at seeing the body and everything. Yeah. Pattern recognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dystonia is not a sensory disorder, but I wonder, have you noticed that there's a difference in how you feel based on which shoes you're wearing? Like if you have more input from the ground, does that change how your dystonia behaves or have you not really noticed a pattern in that regard? It's it's interesting you ask me that because when I get back from the Boston Marathon, I'm going to go do all this testing with different shoes on, um, down in Denver, like kind of try this new thing out, like right before I get my Botox again and then right after and try a bunch of different shoes and, and they're going to like measure all the whatever they're going to do all this stuff. And then they're Mm going to give me data because I love data. Um, awesome. But I will say with shoes, I don't necessarily notice a huge difference, but it's surface. Absolutely. So Mm -hmm. I, I really like crushed gravel because I can hear it. I can Mm -hmm. hear my foot hit it. Yeah. And and I like it to be a little bit uneven because then my foot plants a little weird and I'll get a little sensation up my leg. That's why I think I hate pavement. Pavement makes me really uncomfortable and nervous, but also I don't like, um, I like trail, but I don't like anything really ruddy or rocky because I don't have awareness of how much I'm lifting my leg. And so I trip a lot. So for me, it's like, we have this path in Boulder called Boba Link. I run there all the time or around Wonderland Lake. It's also crushed gravel. And that's really good for me because I can hear it and I get that mm-hmm. feedback. And I, when I was working with the neurological PT, she also had me for a while, like tie something on my left leg that would make a noise, which it mm-hmm. did help me. I just got That's annoyed cool. with it myself, but it did help me because it just <laughs> reminded me like, oh, my leg is there. It's landing. Yeah. I can hear it. You know, oh, I can hear it when it's hitting the ground. So sensory stuff. And a lot of that was brought on because, you know, I had been to neurologists and all this stuff and it started to get better. So we kind of put it behind us. I didn't have MS. And then it came back and it was so much worse the second time. And my husband took a video of me. I didn't know he was recording me. And we were walking home from walking our son to school. And I kept purposely walking over to the leaves because the crunching of the leaves mm-hmm. made me feel better. And I, I would have not even said that to anybody except for that when he showed that video to the doctor, the doctor was like, why are you walking on leaves? And I said, well, I don't know. There's something comforting about hearing the leaves crunch. So 
it's really for me, sensory feedback is super mm-hmm. important. It makes me feel more comfortable. Yeah. Makes that sense. is so cool how adaptive the human body is going. Mm-hmm. Well, this is not doing what I want. So I'm going to use this other system in this really yeah. cool way. I really, we really appreciate you sharing that. It's like people are very yeah. adaptive and the human body is really cool. But And just one more question. Um, what muscles do they Botox? Like what has worked best for you? So for me, it's my posterior tib and then right mm-hmm. in my calf. So those two areas, and it's a little less in my calf and a little bit more in my posterior tib. And we've also played around with dosage. Like mm-hmm. we did way too much last summer, but my doctor said, like she said, do you want to try more? If it's too much, you're going to know. And I was like, yeah. And then <laughs> within three weeks, I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it was way too much. And my, my leg got kind of weak. And so then I, mm-hmm. you know, went to PT and tried to strengthen my leg, leg in other ways. So that's the other thing too, is it's, it's such a game of patience Yep. because there is no, I mean, she did it on, she does it always with EMG. So she always has a needle in my leg and I'm like pushing and she's hearing it. And then she has me relax and she can still hear it crackling. So she places yeah. it really accurately, but the dosage, like, how do you know? You don't know. You just have to kind of figure it out. And so that's like, if anyone has it, I would just say, you have to be super patient. You're going to have times where you're super frustrated. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to get on a roll and then something else is going to throw you off. But you just got to keep going because it's just, you're constantly gathering information about yourself and how your body reacts. Like I never would have thought a year ago, even that commentating would affect me. And then, you know, I was in an airport and could barely stand up. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? Like I fell into this guy's crotch. (laughs) It was so embarrassing. I was just like, I'm so sorry. Like, I swear I'm stone cold sober, you know? And that was like when I started to put together like, wow, the days after I call races, I am really sloppy on my feet, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's just, you're just constantly learning. So fun side story, not to freak you out, the patient, the individual I got to work with, uh, I had to get called into court because she got pulled over because she was having a pretty bad episode. And so they thought she was intoxicated. And she obviously failed. The, obviously, she, her breath laser test was completely negative, but she failed all the tests. So I had to come in and my first experience in a courtroom, for, it's not even about me. I'm afraid like, oh, did you something wrong? was testifying going, yes, she has runner's Cetonia. I am her treating physical therapist. This is a really thing. She's not drinking. She's not like, this is not a thing. And they're trying like, it's, it's very hard for people to understand. Yeah. If you saw this video that my husband took of me, it, you would think I was drunk. Like but the way not, I'm walking yeah. around and no, it's like eight 30 in the morning. I'm like, trust yeah. me, I'm totally sober. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, even, yeah. And, it, and it's, it's really hard to describe to people how debilitating yep. it can be. And it's, and it's, and people don't understand it. And that's fine. I remember when I first was told that I had it, I couldn't even remember when it was called. Like I couldn't stop crying. And he was like, trust me, you can work through this. Like, we just need to be really careful right now. We need this to calm down. Um, and I wasn't hearing anything he was saying after, you know, I don't know if you'll be able to run again. I didn't hear anything. And then we're in the car driving home and I can't even remember what it's called. And I remember I was Googling runners dystopia. (laughs) So I was like, what the hell is this? I don't even know. (laughs) Did you find anything on that? Is that a thing? Yes. I'd be like, (laughs) it is is so (laughs) funny. (laughs) And then Adam was like, no, 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 dystonia, you know? Um, it's actually funny. I've seen articles written about me where they say dystopia, but it's it's <laughs> just it's really I don't know that it's crazy rare. I just think that we we don't know what it is and I think most people right. go something's wrong with me and they just move on. Right. And they stop or they trying. stop running or they give yeah. up or it's like no yeah. like when in fact like as you found staying moving in the optimal amount is probably one of the best things for you. It's oh, like for how sure. you st- yeah. Yeah. So I got to be the 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 research geek here since you said you love data. Have you ever considered publishing? I don't. I know it's not. You're not supposed to publish case studies on yourself, but have you ever considered that? Because getting that information out there would be awesome. Is it, it, I like, mean, even if you want to like, write it, sure. I'm not going to write it. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, that's I'm the thing. I'm not judging like, you at all about that. <laughs> Remember, I had a co-author. Um, oh yeah, that's I right. Think okay, yeah. It is interesting because there's not a lot of information out there. Yeah. And I've actually just been in touch with someone who I raced against in high school who her, her symptoms are so similar to mine. So similar. And um, she also had a bit bad fall, but it was, she was also catching her toe before the fall. And she also, you know, it's like, I think that there, 
is there's, I think that this is more common than we know. And, but there's just no information out there. Right. So it's like, it's just Zero. tough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I judging one you thing. on the writing oh, part sorry. at all. <laughs> yes, sorry, Andrew. I'm, I'm finishing up my dissertation for my PhD right now. And I don't know how I still have hair. Cause I like, yeah, no, yank it I out can't even imagine. Yeah. It's just like, so like, right. Like, and you've written a book. So even with, even with a co-author, it's like, Oh my God. I mean, it would never would have happened without Mary. Just real quick to praise Mary Pallon. I mean, the woman's a saint. And the the best, the crazy thing is like, I would read something and then I would correct it all. I'd say, I would never say this. I would never do that. And she never took anything personally. And she always like revamped it into the way I wanted. But she did the hard stuff. And I just appreciate her because she ended up nailing my voice. And But without her, there'd be no book. I mean, there just wouldn't be. <laughs> it was that a writing can suck. <laughs> sorry i'm just complaining you're in it's it great, deep right but, now <laughs> yeah um one thing that i wanted to mention about runner's dystonia for our listeners is runner's dystonia falls into a category of other types of dystonia that are very movement or task specific and it actually tends to happen to people who are very highly skilled who are professional at a certain thing. So someone who plays a violin or a piano player or somebody who, well, you know, back before computers, a writer, they might find that like they literally can't write with a pen anymore because their hand won't do that specific movement. So runner's dystonia is just one specific type of that. Um, and again, there's so much that is not known about this type of dystonia. Why does it tend to happen to people who were at the top level of their sport or, or who playing a violin is their profession or who writing is part of their profession? But it does tend to affect people who do that certain movement all the time. So uh, people who might be listening who maybe don't have runner's dystonia, but maybe like they're a professional p piano player and all of a sudden like their playing just isn't the same. Know that this falls into the same category and what you need to do is see a neurologist, ho you know, hopefully a movement specialist, but at a minimum, a neurologist. And I would just like to add that you didn't do anything wrong I, you know, when I was diagnosed, I have dealt with a lot of stress in my life. And I was like, well, maybe I have, I, this is on me. Like I haven't really dealt with some of the things that have happened to me. And I have loved my doctors. They've been so clear that like, you didn't do this to yourself. A lot of runners have, have asked me like, well, what did you do wrong? Like, do you think it was doing this? Or do you think it was doing that? And it used to hurt my feelings. And now I'm just like, I'm like, have a shield. It can't penetrate me anymore. Yeah. Cause I know I didn't do anything wrong. Um, but so don't feel like that would just be one thing I would say, like, you didn't do anything wrong. You just got really unlucky and we don't know why you got unlucky, but you didn't do this to yourself. I know athletes that ran through way more injuries than I did that run way more miles than I did that are totally fine. And so I didn't do this to myself. And I think I had to kind of learn that, but I think, you know, people get fearful cause they don't want to get it, which I totally get. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but if you are struggling, like you didn't do it to yourself, it like. It it's just sucks, but you didn't do anything wrong. It's kind of like life. Sometimes, yeah, these are the, the cards you're dealt. But I think to encourage people to come to come and get help for it, the more people recognize that hey, something's going on, I need to get help. The more people come in, talk to neurologists, get treated. The more data points we have, the more we learn, just like you're learning as well, and the better we can learn about this. So please, yeah. if you're if you're experiencing this, don't feel like you have to experience it alone. Get help because that helps not only yourself, it helps others because we learn. And the more we learn, the better we can we can recognize this and be able to help people out. So it only helps totally. others. But yeah, there's it's people want control. Like, what did I do? What is that one thing I can really like, right. eh, sorry, there's nothing. We right. have no idea. Like Yeah. Yeah. So. And which is part of the frustration of it. But yeah. it's all, you know, it yeah, I just I had a lot of people say, well, I think that you're, a, you know, you ran through so many injuries or you ran so many miles. I think this is a good like lesson for other people. And I was kind of like, F you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the right yeah. response. <laughs> and, yeah. That, it's that response. And, and I don't think people understand how little we really understand about the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we are like, and all kudos to our neurologists and the people, mm -hmm. all the researchers doing this stuff. That's the final frontier. And we have barely scratched the surface. I don't think people understand how little 
we truly know about how that thing works. So it's, it's just beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so common for people when you have a problem or or an injury, you want to know why. So either you can avoid getting it again, or you can avoid getting what your friend got. So, but it, when you're asking somebody who's going through something, you certainly don't want to put more, make them feel like it's their fault when often it is not their fault. So just right. advice for listeners. A if little you, empathy. Yeah. yeah. Little empathy goes a long <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah it goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. It goes a long way. <laughs> so um, we've talked, this has been such a great conversation. I want to talk a little bit about your book too. Um, so first of all, your book covers so many important topics. Matt and I both really enjoyed reading it. Um, it covers your journey from a youth runner to professional and Olympian, but it also covers a lot of the dark side of professional sport that we don't talk about, including disordered eating, doping, psychological and sexual abuse. So I'm sure it was hard to decide to write this book. Um, so what, what made up your mind and did you ever have moments of doubt when you question, where you question the repercussions of telling the truth? Yes. The whole time. Um, yeah. the whole time. I think I was frustrated that I felt like my story was, con- my story was constantly being told by other people who had not lived it, who didn't know me. Um, oftentimes people were writing about me who I had never even met. And it was just frustrating. And basically I was going through hearings with different bodies and it was like, don't say anything, don't get involved, just let it go. Like we don't want to affect the investigation or this or that. And I thought someday I'm just going to tell it. Like I'm going to be able to tell my side of the story or I'm going to be able to tell the real story what actually happened. And so it, so I, I think I'm trying to think we, I signed the book deal in 2019 was when I, in 2019, I started talking to potential co-authors. I wanted to find out like who would be interested, who thought this was like important to tell. And we signed, Mary and I signed with Simon and Schuster in 2019 and the book didn't come out until 2023. So it was a long process. And a lot of times during that process, I was having a lot of anxiety about, do I really want to put this out there? Is this going to cost me a future in the sport that I love so much? Is this, this, going to cost me friendships, relationships. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of nervousness. The night before was probably the worst. I thought I'm blowing up my life. Like I have a really good life. Why am I blowing up my life? Um, But I have to say the morning that it came out, I didn't, uh, I was on Good Morning America, but I had filmed it ahead of time. I didn't watch it. I went for a run and I felt so at peace and I just felt like this lightness And I have felt that way ever since of like, I'm not carrying around anybody else's secrets anymore. I'm not carrying around anyone else's shame anymore. And so even though the process of writing, it was hard. And to be totally frank, I put me back in therapy to deal with stuff I had never dealt with. Um, Since its publication, I have felt so just at peace with it. I'm so glad I did it. And I, I have, I feel like it has helped me just as a human tremendously to just tell I get to say what happened. I get to share it all. And I don't have to carry that around anymore. It's like no longer something that I bear. Sounds like it was a really good thing to finally be able to lighten that load. But I think what it sounds like is people need to understand that the process of unloading that is not easy. It is very it's be- stressful. Doesn't beyond. It doesn't even get close to describing what it it. it feels like and that is also a continual journey is you're still working with the therapist you're still working with yourself to be able to continue to move forward so it's not just a it's so much more than a story is what this is what what i'm what i'm hearing from your voice so we again we appreciate you being willing to talk about this obviously you put a book out but it's still yeah yeah is a, is no, a I, lot i mean so we appreciate honestly this, this- this book healed me in a lot of ways mm-hmm. because there were things that I just hadn't dealt with. I could tell you, I could tell the investigators, I could tell people just at a very monotone level things that happened to me, but I hadn't actually truly dealt with them, you know? Yeah. And so in a weird way, this book really saved me because I, it forced me because I started having anxiety about stuff. I started feeling things I had never really felt before. I started th- seeing things from a different light. And I don't know that I would have ever dealt with some of that stuff I mean, I know I wouldn't have. I was like a world-class compartmentalizer. And I don't think I ever really truly would have dealt with 
some of the stuff I had experienced and lived through if it hadn't been for writing the book. So writing the book honestly saved me and set me free. Well, you telling your story not only helped you heal, but think of all the people you helped that got to read your book and, you know, saw themselves in some of the things that you went through, and that's going to give them strength to deal with some issues that they might be going through. But also you testifying and helping get Alberto Salazar banned from the sport, you've saved who knows how many people from his abuse. So that's... I'm sure that, and you know, you wrote about that in your book, but the process of testifying and it was how many years between like the first time you talked to the FBI to when like you were finally done. That's a long time to not know if the person that you're giving information about is actually even going to be punished. Yeah. I mean, it was a decade of my life of it constantly being in the background and not just for me, for my husband as well. And Sometimes we would forget about it. And then, of course, it would come to the forefront. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I really, I, I, I don't, you know, I've been accused of being like a whiner and a complainer. So it's like really hard for me to, to, to say this, but I, it really affected my career those last 10 years because it was just always there. And it's hard to describe it to people. Like I've had this giant, massive cloud of pressure and stress that I couldn't really get rid of until it was wrapped up. And it wasn't wrapped up until I want to say December, 2021 was when it was finally done. All of the appeals, everything was done. So it just was a long time and it was really difficult. And I, but I, I don't regret it. You know, I know it was the right decision. Um, but also it was so hard. It wasn't easy to testify. It felt, um, it it was just very confusing uh, to have someone that, at one point you revered as like a father to then have to, you know, testify against them and, and know that your words might end their career. It was so difficult. It was not an easy decision. It was not an easy process. And it was honestly one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> I mean, it really was. Um, but I, I, you know, I kind of have this, this thing where I have to do what I know is right be, or I can't live with it. Even if I'm not doing something wrong, if I know I can do something that would better the situation I have to. And I, I like that. I'm like that. It, but it, you know, so I knew, I knew I had to see it through, but it was, it was hard. And I think that's been like the good and the bad of the feedback, which is that it's been shocking how many women in all different plays of life, whether they're runners or not have experienced something or saw themselves in the story. Um, and so on the one hand, it's great because they see that they're not alone. But on the other hand, it's been honestly very, very heartbreaking just how many women have experienced something similar or some thread in the book they had experienced. And yeah, it was really heavy. It was so heavy at, that when the book was first released, I had to kind of stop taking emails and responses and people sending stuff to my publisher because it's just like, I can't take on all this trauma right now. Right. Um I'm really sad that it exists and I'm glad that you can see yourself in it, but I actually am not in a place where I can take on all right. this drama. Yeah. yeah. This is why psychologists, like I have, I have a couple of friends that are psychologists that do like trauma care and they have their own psychologist and counselor that they have to go see on a weekly basis because of the amount that people take on. And so it's even more challenging if you've experienced that. And then, but I, I get it like that, that need to do the right thing is you set, I mean, and, no pressure, by the way, but you you kind of set a standard of getting the word out there. And since that time, even though it's only been a couple of years, there's been a lot of other things to come out because people have actually felt proud and strong enough to go, you know what? I need to stand up. This is not right. And a lot of like the NCAA systems, a lot of the pros, like all this stuff needs to change. It's not fair to the end of the athletes. It goes back to my original subjective comment of making things better. It's not just, you know, companies can obviously do a good job. I recognize there are limitations there, but like how they're coached, how we take care of people, how people are trained to view themselves, not just, and, and how other people treat them is so important. And it has to start somewhere. It has some, you know, so it's like having to go through 10 years worth is a lot. I can't even obviously imagine, but you know, you, you were one of those ones who took one of those first big steps and I think there's a lot of people that are going to benefit more than you'll probably ever know. Thank you. I think it's important for us to mention the role of safe sport in 
um, Salazar's lifetime ban and the fact that safe sport didn't exist until 2017. So when you were going through the horrible things that you were going through, Kara, you didn't have this govern. Well, it's a government created body to report misconduct in the sporting world. So Safe Sports website says that since they were started in 2017, they have received over 7,000 abuse and misconduct reports. And that is incredibly sad, but also at least Safe Sport exists to investigate and they have the power to ban people or punish people for what they have done. So before Safe Sport existed, I mean, were there even any known steps for you to report what had happened? And the people you would have reported it to were, you know, your coach. Like, who who else yeah. would you have gone to? There was no system in place at all. And, you know, I lived in this very insular world, and it was like everybody that I would have talked to, it all goes to the same couple people that you know, make the decision that my coach has a job. So it's basically me versus him. That's why I couldn't even accept that it had happened. I had to really tell myself this story that this is an accident um, and then take other steps to protect myself by forcing my husband to travel with me. You know, like I, because it just couldn't be true because there's, there's no, there's no one to tell and there's no situation which I get to keep running in this group or with this brand if I tell. So, you know, safe sport gets, safe sport gets a lot of flack because they take forever with cases. They are backlogged. And I, I just think just what you said, people don't understand how big this problem is. And I think when they created safe sport and like the wake of, of Larry Nasser and all that, it was like, okay, well, we're going to create this and then people will be able to go there and instead, we didn't understand the floodgate that it would be. So Safe Sport gets a, like, I think there was just an article recently about Safe Sport and should they still be receiving money from the government? And I think they should. And I think they should be getting more money so they can hire more people and have more investigators because this problem is so much bigger than anyone wants to admit. And without Safe Sport, what do we have? We don't, we don't have anything else. So I guess, so it sounds like one of the, the easy thing is to say, hey, Safe Sport obviously need more support and money. What what other steps do you think need to be taken next to continue to improve this? Because I would, I would argue, and I think you, you said you said something similar. Where honestly, it just opened the floodgates. The fact that this hasn't been addressed is why they're getting so many things. Because guess what? When you don't address this for the entire existence of athletics, when you finally do, of course, it's going to unload. So, what do you think outside of continuing to fund this and probably expand it? What do you think the next steps are to continue to improve this process? Well, I think that there's sh- uh, there every governing body, whether it's USATF or something with swimming or gymnastics, they should also have an independent body that is checking in with athletes, which is a hundred percent anonymous, and their coaches can't find out because, you know, I just think back to my situation. Where who am I going to tell? There's there's literally nowhere right. for me to go where I don't suffer a consequence from it. And so, even though we have safe sport, it's not perfect, and people are afraid to go there too. So there needs to be more independent parties checking in on athletes, making sure they're okay, that are not tied to brands, that are not tied to sponsors, that are not tied to anything. You know, I I think that's part of the problem too, is that a lot of athletes feel like, where do I go? Even if I go to my governing body, they're sponsored by XYZ. I, you know, I, I just think that we need reform in the whole idea. And also we need to really reform the way we think about coaches and who should be able to be a coach. And I think when you're coaching elite athletes, it's not too much to ask that you go through certification, which now we do have their safe sport certification. A lot of coaches bulk at it. They don't want to do it. I've been doing this forever. I don't need this. Yeah, you do. You actually do. And if you're a coach, you should care, you know, and you should go through these certification processes. But I think, again, there just needs to be more checking in on athletes because a lot of athletes find themselves in these positions and they don't know what to do and they don't know who to talk to and they don't know who to trust. Yeah, and there's probably a lot of athletes who have never heard of safe sport who, if something happened to them, they would have no idea what to do. It should be part of the 
emails you get from your governing body every year when you renew your license, or Mm -hmm. they could do such a better job of publicizing what they do and the fact that reporting is anonymous and so that people know, okay, if this has happened to me, I have this pathway to report it that hopefully isn't going to affect my career as an athlete. Yeah. I mean, I think that is a fear from athletes. You know, they, they are afraid that if they say something, it will affect their career. And so that's why it's important to see these things through. And even, you know, my, my childhood hero is Lynn Jennings and she got her coach banned for life all these years later. And she didn't have to do that. The guy's not even around really, but it takes people like her standing up and doing what's right to set the standard for the next generation. Absolutely. Um, I would definitely say you've done an amazing job of setting that standard for all the pain and suffering that you went through. Like, just think about the people that the, their futures getting the sport. Like I think about my daughter and, you know, I'm not, I, I sh- whatever sport she wants to go into, if she wants to, it's, it's up to her and I'll, we'll support her through that. But you've made a change with that so that we can, as parents, right, can be more comfortable going, okay, we know we still have to be vigilant, but we know it's at least a little safer. And the more people speak up, it just, it's the same thing with talking about, you know, anything like the more you speak up about this, more information there is, the more we know, the better it gets. But the hardest part is this, this speaking up. And it's something yeah. I I won't fully understand because, A, I haven't been in that situation, but also because I was never a poor athlete. So I can't understand to go, oh, my gosh, this might impact my career. So I, it's very easy for me to say that, to go, oh, yeah, you should do this. But it's another it's a very different level to be in that situation. So I'm trying to f- figure out how to how to verbalize that, not not being in that situation, just trying to be supportive. No, no, I totally so appreciate another thing it. that I mean, you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Kara. Oh, I was just going to say um, that we'll go... I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. I don't have a daughter, but I, you know, I didn't originally want to talk to Safe Sport. I didn't want to go down that road with them. Um, but it really was thinking about my nieces and my son's friends. That's what motivated me to do it. So, yeah, you got to think outside yourself. Yeah. So another thing that you talked about quite a bit in your book, which I think is a really important topic that is starting to get more traction, but there's, it feels like we're still at the beginning of all of this, but you talked about how, you know, throughout your career, female athletes just don't receive the support they need for their normal female health concerns, whether it be supporting a middle or high school runner with the changes associated with puberty or supporting a pro runner during and after her pregnancy. So, I mean, it's such a huge topic, but what do you think that coaches, athletes, parents could do better to help female athletes throughout their lifespan to just better understand how their bodies work and change as they get older? I mean, I remember when I was in middle and high school, I had a teammate who she was, and this is so common, right? Like someone who's super fast when they're like in middle school, a female runner, you know, pre-puberty. And then as soon as she gets her period, like her body changes and she's, you know, out the back and you know, all she, you know, there was nothing for to help her. She just, you know, used to be really good. And now she wasn't, and she didn't go to, you know, she didn't run in college. Nobody kind of helped her through that period. And none of our coaches had anything to say about that. But I think that helping teenage girl athletes just understand that what's happening is normal. And even though, yes, they might be slower now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be slower forever. I just think it should be part of the educational and coaching process, just like so many other things that we teach athletes. Do you have any thoughts about how we could improve that for girl athletes and what that would look like? I totally agree. It should be a part of everything. I I had a wonderful, supportive mom and everything, but like no one talked to me about that when I was going through it. I was just like, I failed. I, I got bigger and now I suck and now I'm not good anymore. And I wish there had been someone that said, no, actually your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Give it two or three years. Talent doesn't go away. Trust me, 
that you need this new body. This new body is going to take you to the places that you dream about. This little body actually can't do it. It can't. It physically can't. But the new body can. And But I just didn't have anyone saying that to me. And I think it's having these conversations. I think in the last, you know, Lauren Fleshman talked about it in her book that came out last year as well and normalizing these conversations. And I think it it does fall on women who have made it as professionals to speak openly about it and to speak to high school kids and to say like, this is totally normal and it's okay. And you're not doing anything wrong. And this actually is going to get you to where you want to be in life. And I think, I do think that coaches should have this understanding. I do think it can be tricky if you have a male coach and you're a teenager, you probably don't, you might not feel comfortable talking to your coach about having your period and what that means. Um, But that's why I think there just needs to be more communication overall, just in the running community. Um, And I, I do feel like a lot of the elites could lead that conversation for the youth so that they grow up knowing getting your periods normal. It actually is good for you. It makes you healthy. It gives you a body that can handle the training that you'll someday be able to do. And you haven't failed because you got your period. You're actually, it's exactly what's supposed to happen. Like that's literally a sign of you being healthy. And if you right. have it and then suddenly it gets abnormal or you stop having it, that's something that needs to get addressed. Like don't hide that. So, but right. Yeah, I think we need to keep talking about this. Says the, yeah. I mean, so I'm growing up with an all-female household, even our cat, my cat is female. So I've got all <laughs> estrogen here. So I, I get it. But Yeah, so but it like, needs yeah, to be just talked about. Talk. Normalizing the conversations. Yeah, exactly. Like not mm-hmm. being embarrassed about yeah. it. Like, look, look no, yeah. if your daughter decides to run, she's going to get her period. She's going to be frustrated yeah. with her body for a couple of years. And what if she knew that that was okay? What if she knew, right. you know what, this happens to everybody. It happened to the best yes. runners that ever lived. And it's just a frustrating part, but the gain that I get from once I get through this is like crazy, right? And what if we, what if it was just normal to be, for her to be able to say, dad, I'm so frustrated. And you're like, I know, I know, but trust me, it's going to be, you know what I mean? Like, instead of being like, I I ate too much. I got my period. Right. No, yeah. that's not it. It's like, yes, I recognize you. you your period started the, the morning of your race. I, I I understand this must be really frustrating. In the long run, no pun intended, this is good for you. Yes, today's right. probably going to suck, right? That's just right. how right. it goes. And it, Sorry, and this I, is biology. And I feel for you, but, right. And, and yeah, you're allowed I've, to be annoyed and you're allowed to be like, yeah, this sucks. Because okay. you know what? It does. It does. <laughs> but keep going. Don't give up yeah. because you're going to be all right, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the more, the more we educate girls and their parents and their coaches about this, the more information there is out there, it keeps, you know, all of the misinformation from spreading. Like I know when I was a runner, if you didn't get your period, it meant that you were training enough and you were really fit. You were fit. Right. Yep. And if it comes back, it means that you're eating too much. You're not fit. You're gaining weight. Like that's all bullshit. And yeah. until a lot of people talk about that and that information gets down to teenage girls, so whether that's on TikTok or whatever, we need teenagers to understand that that's not true. It's not good for your period to go away or it's not good to not have it come until you're in your 20s. And the more that it's talked about, the less likely it is that the incorrect information will be the only information that those athletes get. Yeah. I think if running's being honest, we do have a cultural problem with this specifically Mm -hmm. and we can pull out college coaches or pro coaches, but it doesn't solve the problem, which is that from the very beginning, you know, I had an eating issue in college. I didn't learn it in college. I learned it way earlier. And it was me being in a vulnerable position where I started, you know, I started doing those things that I had learned about a lot earlier. So I think we need to be really open that, yeah, we can still pull out bad characters. Don't get me wrong, but that doesn't actually solve the problem because the seeds are planted mm-hmm. so young. And I, th- I think until we have a real reckoning and we really start talking about this to parents and to kids at a young age, it's going to be a constant, we're going to constantly hear this story because we have a problem yep. in our sport and it, we just do. And And we can't solve it by saying, well, that person, you know, sure, Alberto, he hurt people, but 
that didn't cure this problem that our sport has, right? It starts so much younger and earlier. And if we really want to change it, that's what we have to do. We have to go so much earlier and talk to girls so much earlier so that, yeah, it's just, otherwise we're going to keep having these problems. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like it's it's kind of a classic not to to blame certain things, but we as a society tend to be very reactive, right? It's like, mm-hmm. oh, it happened. Now we're going to do this. Whereas what we really need to focus on is prevention. Like we need to start from day one. Like this, yes. this is just part of the conversation. We need to normalize talking about body functions. We need to talk about what is normal. We need to be educating youth, parents, coaches, and everybody to know this is normal. We need to acknowledge it too. Yeah. Our sport has a challenge with a lot of disordered eating, abuse, things like that. Body dysmorphia is huge, not just within women, also within men and men don't even say it at all. Often until it's not too, until it's too late. Does, do people actually figure that out? So it's, it's just coming to terms with this and being open and going, we need to have these conversations, even if it's uncomfortable, it doesn't yeah. matter. Like your, your light minor discomfort. Cause you don't want to talk about periods or you don't want to admit that the, you know, the sport has a big problem with eating disorders that those feelings like don't matter if it means protecting the next generation or actually you come recognizing that you have a problem with it. And you don't, the reason that that's why it makes you uncomfortable is Go for things that make you uncomfortable because it probably means there's something there that needs to be addressed. And this is a, a perfect, perfect example because the only thing it's going to do is if we talk about this, people are going to be faster. They're going to be better. They're going to be healthier. There is no evidence. There's no evidence that said any of these old ways of thinking have actually improved performance. It's actually just been nothing but destructive. Right. And it's yes. like. It's bad that we actually now have real, like, enough research on to go, oh, yeah, maybe we should stop doing it. It's like, yes. Like, if it's that much research, like, this should have been addressed a while ago. Well, and it comes to, you know, a lot of things come down to simple, like, culture changes. Like, how many probably thousands of times have we all heard somebody say, she looks really fit? You can't look at somebody and tell how fit they are. And usually when you say she looks really fit, all you're talking about is her body fat percentage. So not, you know, catching yourself, like not saying that, not saying it in front of teenagers who are very impressionable, but also just not saying it at all. We can't tell who's fit by how they look. We can tell they're fit by lots of different measures, but how somebody looks is not a good predictor of what, how they're going to perform. So let's stop saying that. Yeah. I I think my mom was the queen of, if I just lose five more pounds, I'll, I'll look good. And by the way, she always looked good. Always. My mom is super fit, super muscular, but like I, you know, I, and I never thought that really affected me till I got older. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that did affect me a little bit like her insecurity and always feeling like she needed to lose five pounds to be worthy. I think it did rub off on me a little bit. And so I have been really conscious. I've caught myself saying stupid stuff in front of my son, even, you know, where I'm like, oh, I feel so fat. Or, you know, we all make these comments. And then I'm like, I really, but we're so conditioned to say these things and feel these things. So even as someone who's really conscious about it and tries really hard, I still slip up. But I think that's part of it is us all being really conscious of the way we talk about other people and the way that we talk about ourselves. Because the kids are listening. They hear yeah. everything. They do hear everything. And unfortunately, they, you know, it's they, the more they hear it, the more likely they are to model things and stuff like that. But that's why, like, yes, we can have traumas, but it is our responsibility to make sure the trauma startup stops with our generation and go, mm-hmm. no more. You know, I know we dealt with this. I acknowledge this. This is painful, but this stops with us and we're going to make this better for the next generation. So, which is a lot easier said than done. But this was awesome. Kara, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really encourage everyone to get a copy of your book again, which comes out. You said this. It was March. March 26th. 26th. Yeah. Okay. Got it. It was a phenomenal book. I'm going to tell uh, the story that I told uh, you two earlier is that uh, the book came to us last week and I was like really excited to read it. And then it disappeared. I couldn't find it because my wife took it and she read it. And so <laughs> I read the whole thing yesterday in one sitting. It was awesome doing speed reading, but it was great. So I'd highly encourage you not for, for a variety of reasons to get, get the book, 
read it, make yourself aware. And I think maybe the bigger conversation we've had is don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations where that's about your body. It's like, you know what, if it's something that you're struggling with or something you're experiencing, be it something neurological, something going, you should feel comfortable talking about this. And if it's serious enough, you need to go seek help. If you're wait, the longer you wait, it's not necessarily going to get better. So be open to talking about this. Be open to sharing this. The more you talk about it, the more everybody else learns. And I think there need, we need to remove that shame with that. And I think, Carrie, you've done a phenomenal job being a massive spearhead for not just, you know, with safe sport, not just with speaking up, but also for how people see themselves. And it goes back to our very beginning subjective question that you talked about going, start thinking a little bit more about being nicer to yourself, right? Like, do you have to hit the exact splits every time? No, because actually we know now that you hitting the exact split every time isn't necessarily good for you. There's normal variety. Our bodies are not perfect. They're not machines. And that's actually what makes it amazing. So thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to listen to know in terms of where they can find you? Obviously you have a great website. You've got a great social media platform. I know you just said you started your Strava, so I don't necessarily want to like throw people that way, you know, so what's the best way to find you? What's the best way to follow your journey and your amazing commentating, by the way, which I can't say this enough watching you over the last couple of years, commenting in like New York and all this stuff is awesome to have your voice there. You do a great job not to make you embarrassed or anything. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate having this conversation with you both. And um, just thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sweet. You can find us and we're going to post this. We'll have it on all of our normal channels, be it YouTube, Spotify, um, iTunes, the different areas you can find that. You can also find us on all the different social media channels that are amazing. Social media wizard Bach puts up there, be it Instagram. Our website is the main place you can find us. TikTok. And I'm going to give Bach credit because he did an amazing job with this. LinkedIn is actually still really taking off, which blows my mind every time. But it's a great place. Again, any place you want to find us apologize. If you do contact us, it does take us a little bit of time to respond because we do get lots of emails, but we appreciate you following hope. As always, this is helpful. Hope you get some information from this episodes that changes how you think, because that's all we want to be able to help you with.